Welcome to Rocking Your Prize. I'm Dr. Alice Evans, and today I'm delighted to welcome David Stasfidge, Professor of Politics at New York University. David, welcome. Thank you. It's very good to be here. Okay, so we're going to discuss your new book, The Decline and Rise of Democracy. We'll explore your theory about prop systems, technology, and then look at some illustrative cases in the Middle East, China, and Europe. But first, David, I have a question. Is democracy a modern invention? No, most certainly not. Democracy is a very ancient invention, and it's not a very ancient invention in the way a lot of people think of it. They tend to think of it as something that arose at one point in one time, uh, generally in Athens, Greece. Uh, and in fact, what I try to argue in the book is that if you define democracy as simply the people having an important say in government, then many human societies over time, over thousands of years, over general regions of the world have, exp uh, have, have had this type of, uh, of, of form of governance. So democracy is a human invention. It's not a specifically European one. But how, how, how do we know this, David? Well, one of the ways we know this is that we can go and we can look at records uh, from um, ethnographers who went out um, generally from Europe or from the United States and they started discovering other societies and seeing how they how they behaved and how they governed themselves. And especially when we think of um, early uh, um, conquest uh, across the Atlantic arriving in, in, in North America or in Mesoamerica, Europeans sometimes discovered societies that actually seemed uh, much more democratic than their own at the time. And this would have been in the, the 16th or the 17th century. And so that's one way we can know. Can you give me some examples of early early council governance in pre-modern era? Well, one of the classic ones that we know um, the most about uh, would be the the Huron, the people of the Huron. They called themselves the Wendats. Uh, Europeans called them the Huron. Uh, and they had an extensive form of, of council governance with multiple levels, with very broad participation. Uh, so that's one example. There are others in the uh, uh, in early Mesopotamia, pre-colonial Africa. It was a general phenomenon. Wait, in Africa too, the council governance was widespread? It was indeed. It was indeed, yes. Because you know that, I find that interesting because, well, there's a famous paper, I'm sure you know, by Asimoglu, Johnson and Robinson, and they tried to explain Botswana's exceptional success by pointing to its Kugotla um, council governance. But maybe... Botswana, what the Swana weren't unique in having council governance then. No, I think that's true, and we 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 know this because of the the work, uh, pioneering work of uh, anthropologists uh, led by George Peter Murdoch um, uh, in in the post-war era um, of the 20th century, where they went out and compiled uh, from individual. Um, um, ethnographic accounts of these societies, uh, among other things, how, how they govern themselves and whether they tended to govern themselves by councils or by having, um, you know, a supreme leader who ruled through subordinates. And uh, council governance was actually very widespread um, in pre-colonial Africa, but also in other areas of the globe. Wow. So, but, but let's not be too optimistic. Not all societies were democratic. Some were authoritarian. And for you in your book, you argue that whether they go down one path or the other, is a response to a common challenge of taxation, how to extract the maximum surplus without making the goose hiss. Tell me about this challenge and how they try to overcome it. Yes, and when we set, when we talk about taxation here, we have to think of it in a very broad way, not in terms, in terms of modern taxation involving currency, but it could be any redistribution of resources. So, uh, uh, you know, in the Northwest coast of, uh, of, of North America, there was a group called the, the Kwakiutl that had quite an autocratic system where if you uh, brought anything back from a fishing expedition or a hunting expedition, you had to give half of that to the chief. Um, that's not taxation as we think of it today, but it certainly felt like that to them. And so the whole question then became, uh, if there is a ruler or rulers, how are they actually able to extract that? And that involves two problems. First of all, they need to know what people were producing. And second of all, if even if they know what they're producing, they have to actually have a way of collecting it. Right. So how? So you say that their strategy for extracting the maximum but not too much depends on crop yields and technology. And so if the caloric output is easy to predict owing to stable temperatures or irrigation and other technology, then rulers can calculate the right level at which to tax. But if yes. the temperature is unpredictable, if the landscape is unknowable, if prediction is difficult, 
then they need to overcome those informational constraints. And you say they have two options. Right. So if prediction is, is difficult, then it, it, it becomes uh, uh, an issue of, first of all, whether natural factors, exogenous natural factors make prediction difficult. But mm -hmm. then it also, uh, 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 obviously, rainfall would be would be uh, beyond anyone's control, <laughs> certainly at this time. But then you also referred to something that is of human invention, and that is something like irrigation. So there were technologies that made things uh, more predictable, and there were natural factors that made more predict made them more predictable. And then the two routes one could go is one, which I call the, the, the council route, which was to actually get people together um, in a group, in a council, and try to use them to extract information about what could what could be taxed and actually use them to collect things as well. And that involves a substantial amount of shared power, a collective form of governance. The alternative is to try to do it sort of on your own, not exactly on your own, because you'd need to have a bureaucrat bureaucracy to do that. So you need to have agents that you remunerate that are sort of uh, your own uh, subordinates and then do it that way. And so there's either the democratic route or the autocratic route using a bureaucracy. Right. So for your in, in this theory, the sort of the leaders are seeding democracy. They're, they're soliciting council governance in order to access information about crop yield so they know the right level at which to tax. Th that's correct. Exactly. It's something that basically emerges not because rulers are somehow more beneficent or because people have ideas about why why collective governance is better. It's something that emerges for these material reasons that an in, the, in a sense, it would be very hard for anyone to effectively govern on their own uh, without, without some sort of collective governance. I'm with you. But let me clarify, if the purpose of, elicit, of soliciting council governance is to overcome this informational constraint, I have a question then, why would council members be motivated to faithfully report yields? I mean, what's their incentive? And I don't understand that. And so I don't understand how it overcomes the informational constraint. Yeah. So there, there's a critical assumption that one has to make, which I think can be justified. If council members, um, if this is just pure extraction that's not going for anything that's useful from the point of view of council members, um, then they would have no, of course, no incentive to, to tell the truth. Now, if it is the case that there's some overlap of interest between ruler and council members, then you can get a phenomenon where they'd actually like to tell the truth. So that could be, for example, if there's a need for common defense or public works or something like that, where the council members themselves or the people that the council members represent are getting something. There's some uh, quid pro quo. OK, I'm with exactly. you. Exactly. Then you're actually getting there. But there does have to be that overlap. If it's just purely extractive, then this this solution does not work. Right. So it's not just about accessing information. There, there's some exchange there. Right. OK, so let's now try explore, uh, grow, uh, applying this theory to different world regions, starting with China. So why didn't China democratize? <laughs> Well, I think it has something to do with with two 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 factors that arose um, or integrated with each other. The first area issue is is that China had a form of intensive high yield agriculture from a very very early date. Uh, the type of soil in northeastern China where the early dynasties were located was easily formed uh, with even primitive tools. Uh, it had substantial yields. Um, and, and the, the second uh, feature was that the Chinese established uh, technologies at a very early date for sort of observing what people were making. And the nature of this intensive agriculture was such that it was more predictable, it was more observable, and it was also in a more compact space. So if you wanted to sort of monitor what people are doing using your subsidiary, not your subsidiaries, your, your subordinates, um, then, then that was all more feasible. So I, I think it has to do with both the natural environment but this is not a story of uh, geographic determinism. I think it also has to do with the various technologies that that emerged from an early date that didn't emerge as uh, as as from as early a date as uh, as elsewhere. Right. So it's a question of geography and technology. Yes. And that enabled and that and so given the the, the bureaucratic technology for observation and control, they could have a strong bureaucracy, they could under access all the information, they didn't need council governance. Exactly. But here's my question. Doesn't the existence of a bureaucracy 
presuppose a strong hegemonic state, you know, with monopoly on the use of legitimate force, able to dispatch the minions, uh, to, to survey the land, to construct large scale irrigation like the Grand Canal, you know, unimpeded by local authorities or warlords. So I wonder, is state strength really a question of technological innovation rather than political prowess? Doesn't it also require that pre-existing hegemony? Well, it certainly uh, it certainly involves political prowess, but it also involves technology to the extent that uh, to you, the, if you want a bureaucracy to function effectively, then you need to have or it helps to have certain technologies. Let me give oh, you an example. Sure. We can agree that technology yeah. is important, but I'm saying that can we really explain the strong state just by invoking their access to technology without without explain? We also need to explain how the state came to be so dominant, don't we? Yes, and I think that's that that's part of it. But what I think I'm saying is that the the technologies and the environment make it more likely that a strong state can 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 merge. They don't need it. It doesn't necessarily imply that one will. Again, it's not deterministic, sure. but this is this is this is the way I see it happening. Yeah. Okay, so I also have a question about the right level of taxation. Is this really a question of knowable productivity? Um, I mean, you know, suppose the leader can calculate the agrarian surplus. Don't we also need to explain why people would hand it over? Right. And and presumably why they're handing it over is that there has to be some degree of coercion in any system of taxation, but they also have to expect that they're getting something in return. And so if you think again at the council level, then council members in these early democracies, it generally was not the case apart from very small communities that everybody participated. Uh, but there were sort of higher ups that participated and that in some uh, way, shape or fashion represented others. So first of all, for those higher ups, they have to uh, have the sense that they're actually getting for something for this. And then people lower down the totem pole have to have the sense that with respect to their own higher ups, they're actually getting something as well. Uh, because right. Of, yeah. Yeah. Right. Definitely. So there is also this. And another thing you mentioned in the book is the importance of sequencing, that the state consolidated power before economic growth took off. Why, why was sequencing important? Well, the way I think sequencing is important is that if you start off uh, for the reasons I suggested and also perhaps the reason you suggested and, and you, you were able to create a powerful state bureaucracy, then it's, it's much harder to transition to democracy, to early democracy or modern democracy after that because you have a system that is very stable that works. It's much different if you start off with the early democratic pattern and then you're able to add a bureaucracy in afterwards. Uh, and this is what, what would have been the case for European countries where they had practices of collective governance many centuries prior to the development of uh, state uh, bureaucracies resembling anything close to, to modern bureaucracies. And so when you have that opposite sequence, then it's possible for the sort of the council, the collective system of collective governance to tame the bureaucracy as it were, rather than having the bureaucracy dominate. But may I push back on that? I mean, I don't understand. How does the Song Dynasty's ability to tax sales or tax transport explain the dearth of successful bottom-up organizing for democratization? I mean, don't we also need to explain the organizational capacities of society? You know, when we talk about the squid pro quo, why weren't, Ch I mean, there were a number of tax rebellions in China, right? Why yeah. weren't Chinese uh, taxpayers able to organize collectively against the state, especially when the state becomes much weaker? Why weren't they, a why were, you know, ordinary people able to push for more of a voice in how their money was spent, et cetera? They did do that periodically. And so that's where, the, the, the Chinese system has a system of accountability, but it's all ex post accountability. Basically, if uh, if if we have famine because there wasn't enough uh, you know grain provided, or if we have floods because the there was not adequate flood control, then that's the emperor's fault, and um, so they, sh they should be overthrown. Now, th I think the thing that happens is you do get those things periodically in China. In fact, very frequently. Uh, but when someone is overthrown much of what remains in terms of the state apparatus uh, is still there. It doesn't disappear entirely. It's, it's fundamentally different than what happened uh, in Europe after the fall of Rome, where the, the existence of any sort of central state apparatus just disappears. In China, the state is never really, the bureaucratic state is never really destroyed to that extent. And so whoever comes into power as a result of a successful result, revolt uh, just begins to rule in the same way as the previous people um, through a bureaucracy.
I'm, I'm still not clear on this. So you're saying sequencing matters if you have a strong bureaucracy, if you have this strong taxation system before growth, then it's difficult to get democracy off the ground. But I don't understand how just being taxed for my transport or my sales stops me from organizing collectively to push for democratization. I don't oh, understand you, that bit. It, it doesn't it doesn't it doesn't stop you from doing that. That's right. It doesn't stop you from doing that. But then the question becomes, once someone comes to power as a result of revolt, what do they do? Mm. They no longer have to rely on collective governance because they have the, the autocratic alternative as feasible to them. And right. So that's what I think is really critical. Mm. Uh, okay, okay, good. But here's the next question. So, in explaining the or so you're explaining the origins of uh, a strong state in China by reference to geography and technology. How relevant are the uh, you know what happened two thousand years ago? How relevant is that in explaining the strong Chinese state today? I mean, as, as you recognize, state strength fell dramatically in China, right? Wealthy aristocrats gained power. What well, 1916 heralded the start of the warlord era, and and power, state power, had to be consolidated by Chiang Kai-shek, Sun Yat-sen, the GMD, and then later the CCP through um, you know struggle sessions, terror, land reform campaigns. You know, were the CCP starting from a weak base? You know, how relevant is it that there was a strong state in China 2000 years ago? Right. So I definitely don't want to be in the game of saying that because you were uh, an autocracy 2000 years ago means that you're necessarily 100 percent sure mm -hmm. to be an autocracy, mm -hmm. an autocracy today. What I do think is, is, is very relevant here is that there are certain patterns of Chinese governance in the Chinese state um, that reassert themselves over time and that prior successive dynasties learn from prior dynasties. And this extends into, you know, into the 20th century and into the into the PRC. Uh, one, you know, the best example I, I, I use in the book is having to do with control of people through household registration. That's something that gets established early on. It's something that Chiang Kai-shek's nationalists use as a means and where did they get the technology to do that from from the prior imperial government it's something that the prc uses where did they get some of the information from that from the nationalists and it's something that's very important today and so you have a system of household registration um that is effective for for operating a, an, an autocracy and that's something that's been present right the way through whereas that idea if the if the practice or the know-how to organize something like that had somehow disappeared Mm -hmm. um, then I think it it would be it it would be harder. Yes. Okay. Okay. I I I I'll grant that. All right. So let's move on to the Middle East and North Africa. Um. So the middle markedly authoritarian region. Why is this? Well, I think there are two big reasons. The one I emphasize in in, in the book has to do again with the persistent uh the the emergence of a bureaucratic uh, um autocratic form of rule early on. Uh, the second of which has to do with colonialism, and I'll get to that at the end. I do mention that, but the, it's less uh, germane to what I talk about for most of that ch chapter of the book. So if you think about societies in pre-Islamic Arabia, they actually govern themselves through a form of early democracy, through council, through collective governance. Um, this was a pattern that was deeply set. Um, and you have even in, you know, in the Quran, there's this principle of shura, which means consultative rule. Um, which uh, it, it people aspire to even after the initial Islamic conquests. But what happens is that as the Islamic conquests proceed, they en end up conquering an area of Iraq, um, formerly uh, controlled by the Sasanian dynasty, that actually had built up a very strong bureaucracy, again, based on intensive agriculture with deep knowledge of what people were producing and an ability to control them. And so this leads to a sort of reverse, this expansion leads to a reversion to an autocratic form of rule uh, that I think persists in many ways and in many parts of, of, of the region um, up until up until this day. Again, I don't want to say because uh, the, 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 the there was this the, the Sasanian um, dynasty gave a bureaucracy to the, the caliphate that this determined for all points in time forward that the Middle East would be authoritarian, um, but it certainly didn't help in terms of uh, the prospects for a democracy there. And then the second aspect that, that comes in uh, towards the end, of course, is colonial powers in many cases were not actually favorable to um, Arab peoples having democratic rule or local rule. 
uh, even when those peoples did express that. So that did not help much either. Okay, so let me clarify to make sure I get this straight. So the Sassian Empire has this sophisticated system for surveying the land. You've got this rich, intensive agriculture enabled by the soils, uh, which can be easily calculated. And you also raise that in the Nile Valley, there's no easy exit option. So that limits people's uh, capacity to contest extractive taxation, right? So it's partly about geography technology that enables the strong state in the Sassian Empire. Do I have that right? That's right. Okay. So here's my question. Is the dearth of democracy in the Middle East and North Africa today really due to having a strong bureaucracy 2,000 years ago? And I even wonder, is state capacity the problem? I mean, is state capacity the key impediment today? Because if I look at pretty much any indices for um, state capacity, the Middle East and North Africa scores pretty pro lowly. You know, it, they don't. It doesn't strike me as a you know a great place for state capacity, and and also, MENA countries with high state capacities actually might be more democratic. Take for example Tunisia, right? Strong state capacity, able to assert order over fragmented kinship groups, and Tunisia was the one country where you really had a democratic transition uh, after the Arab Spring. So I don't look at the Middle East and say, number one, well, your problem is too much state capacity uh, as inimical to democracy. But maybe I misunderstood. No, no, no. I think I think that the, the thing to clarify there is that there are different types of state capacity, I think, and that what matters, uh, uh, there are the, the capacity to run a welfare state, for example. Um, and that that requires an immense amount of state capacity, but it's not necessarily that helpful for cementing authoritarian rule. Uh, there are other types of capacity, particularly in the security realm and the internal security realm mm -hmm. that are much more important uh, for um, for maintaining authoritarian rule. And that's a form of capacity um, subject to, you know, um, inherited from um, centuries prior that I think is helpful. And, you know, the great example here is what happens in Iraq after um, ISIS comes in. And they have this directive that I speak about in the book and they say, well, we just want to keep the local bureaucracy. Yes. From Iraq, which wasn't a bureaucracy that was, it was not a development bureaucracy in the East Asian model. But they said mm -hmm. we, we want to work through the existing bureaucrats because that's how we'll be able to better rule in. They didn't call it their authoritarian way, but outsiders would see it, certainly see it as their authoritarian way. Yeah, I, I mean, we can distinguish between different types of state capacity, but it's interesting that you point to similarly strong causes in China in East Asia, for example, and the Middle East and North Africa, you know, this sophisticated agricultural and bureaucratic technology able to observe, survey, you know, the land. Similar, you know, the, the suggestion is that the Sassian Empire and the Song Dynasty had similar kinds of technology and nobility, but then we're ending up with slightly different kinds of state capacity today. Yes, that's right. That's the, you know, okay. I, I agree okay. that completely. The, 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 the Chinese model is an extreme version of state capacity. That's clear. OK, yeah. right. And I'm just, with you. just further on the Middle East, what we should also emphasize, of course, is that none of the 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 absence of democracy has to do with Islam itself. It's really something that appears that way. But it's actually the fact that the nature of the Islamic conquest led to the inheritance of a bureaucratic state that allowed for a different form of governance. It wasn't in anything inherent to um, to that particular religion. Right. OK, so having discussed China and the Middle East, let's move on to Europe. Why did Europe democratize? So democratized uh, over the very long run, uh, the, the critical feature, I think, is that Europe did not have this example of centralized bureaucratic rule characterized by, uh, undergirded by uh, intensive agriculture, um, uh, technologies that allowed for observing people and the, the presence of a strong central bureaucracy. Even in Roman times, the, the Roman bureaucracy was quite thin relative to um, the bureaucracy of the Han Dynasty, which would have existed around the same time. After the fall of Rome, you get a collapse of anything resembling, if even faintly resembling, a central bureaucracy in Europe. And so gradually over time, anyone who wants to rule has only one choice, and that's to try to rule by seeking consent and cooperation uh, from your people rather than ruling in the top-down bureaucratic fashion. So that's how the ball got rolling.
So your argument then, to clarify, is that large-scale representative systems first emerged in Europe because of its agrarian and bureaucratic backwardness that the the European they they couldn't the European rulers couldn't predict crop yields. So because Europe was so behind in its agricultural technology, so that's why it needed to solicit the council governance, right? Precisely. This was a story where the weak inherited democracy in the sense that European states were backwards with regard to their technologies, their methods of taxation, their agricultural technologies. Um, and because of that, there's a lot more uncertainty out there. There's a lot more difficulty in ruling. And so the only uh, alternative is for rulers to, 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 to try to join together and govern collectively. Where Europeans are uh, exceptional is that they succeeded in scaling up this practice of collective governance to larger scale states when you think of representative assemblies for entire kingdoms whereas as i say in the book the you know the practice of early democracy was most often a local phenomenon and as societies grew larger tended to wither away so in europe what's really exceptional is that this ability to uh, maintain this form of governance even as states expanded in size um, i think is quite exceptional and, well, that's and the you second step and and you say that as an example of extraction that even under the the most extractive uh, times of King John the you know, they were only taking one percent in taxation whereas under the Song China it was ten percent. That's right. Where he was taking the the, the average would have been about one percent of GDP for the time, um, and the uh, the you know under the peak of John's uh, quote heavy extractions we were only at three percent three percent of GDP. I. Yeah, so that's uh, there are error bars around those statistics because of uncertainty, yeah. but they're so different that it's it's quite it's quite dramatic. Yeah. And tell me also about the communal movement. What caused this? What what was this phenomenon? And what caused it? Well, the communal movement is is fascinating, and I just if I could segue a little bit back to China because that's a nice way to think about it. Um, China in Europe experienced commercial revolutions at roughly the same time, a little bit earlier in China. This was during the medieval warm period. And there's a there's a, a great belief that it was probably help, uh, driven by climate in part. And so you got the growth of towns and cities, networks of trade. And in Europe, this happened in a setting where central control was extremely weak to negligent, to, 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 to non-existent. Mm -hmm. And so mm -hmm. if you're a town and the king of... Uh, France, for example, um, wants to assert his power over you or, you know, somewhere else in Burgundy or elsewhere, uh, that you, you probably have an ability to declare yourself an autonomous city. And that's, of course, what so many what so many European cities do. Uh, and, and and that's a fundamentally different development model from what you see in China, where cities also grow. There was urban growth, but they were controlled by the state. There was a you know, prior state tax bureaucracy. And so you get these new commercial trading relationships going. But the central state establishes something like 2000 new tax centers to say, OK, we're going to tax this trade. And right. Just, it's the opposite example. So your story really is about geography, growth and an inherent desire for democracy. So geography in that solar radiance enables city development and then people inherently want to self-govern. Right. And as long as they've got the sequencing right, as long as there's not an already a strong state, then they are able to self-govern. Right. I think that's right. OK, let me push back. Let me push back on the, this theory. Because, I, well, I, I wonder, doesn't self. So you say self-government in cities just require, you know, we just have this inherent desire to be de democratic and self govern but doesn't it also require self, self social cooperation um, between members? Um, Grief and Tabellini, they have this paper, as well as Joe Henrik, and they highlight that in communal movements, is it communal or communal? Communal, you're saying. Communal, communal we would say. Communal, yeah, communal. I'm prone to malapropism, sorry. Yeah, yeah. In this communal, they didn't just push for democratic concessions from the state. They also came from different clans, different regions, and they cooperated with each other. Um, they invested in legal infrastructure. They enforced contracts. They taxed their members. They provided public goods. Um, they provided social safety nets. And I think they also swore moral oaths that they would recognize universal obligations to all people, not just one's clan. Whereas um, 
a grief and Thamelini highlight that in pre-modern China, social cooperation was always arranged through the clans, and the clans provided poor relief, education, rituals in ancestral halls, etc. And the cities in China, as you say, were, just, were not centers of cooperation. They were just these administrative places before the 19th century. So my question is, I don't know if solar radiance and an inherent desire for democracy explain the birth of the communal, 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 communal movement, communal movement, because I think we've also got to explain how members cooperated with each other. And I think people like Joe Henrik would say, well, it requires low kinship intensity. And that was unique to Northwestern Europe. Um, as Goody and Jonathan Schultz and Henry have shown. And, you know, they had much less cousin marriage and this enabled cooperation and trust in neighborhoods, guilds, workplaces. And those civic associations organized to secure concessions from the state. So I wonder, what do you think of this argument that it was intensive kinship is why people didn't organize from below, whether that's in the Middle East or, or China, as contrasts with Europe? Yeah, so I have two responses to that one. One is that I, I think maybe rather than speak of an inherent desire for democracy, I think it would be that people have an inherent desire not to be controlled by someone from the outside over whom mm -hmm. they have no no authority. And so mm -hmm. that's the, the, an inherent desire for self-rule. Okay. And it's the case that in the early stages, these European communes often had very broad participation, but the participation tended to become um, N more oligarchic over time. Now, I think where the the idea of the weakness of ethnic ties in Europe uh, is sort of half right and half wrong. It's half right to the extent that yes, it's true that there were not those same uh, ethnic ties in terms of clans that uh, that that influenced how um, trading relationships worked uh, in Europe. But it turns out also that if you read someone like Mark Bloch, he'll say that Europeans rebuilt their own equivalent of ethnic ties by having guilds. Mm -hmm. And the guild was very prominent in all these cities, and the guilds were sort of a substitute mechanism uh, for the absence of ethnic ties. It was a way of binding cooperation uh, together by members of a guild, but there were many guilds of a city. And as a member of one guild in a city, you might not necessarily have the city's overall interest um, in view. Right. So you have a club, but you're able to cooperate beyond your family so there's not society is not fragmented and fractured I think yes but then the question is can you cooperate beyond the guild and you have mm -hmm. disputes between guilds you have a lot of conflict between merchants guilds and 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 um or you have a series of guild, you know if things were so happy uh why is it that you have an immense number of guild revolts uh where or craft guilds in the 14th century extending into the 15th century uh rebel against control by merchants guilds um, there, you know, there's a lot of violence in these cities in this way. Yeah, so I think we can all agree that guilds fight to protect their members. Like, yeah. you know, yeah. as a gender scholar, I can think of, right? G yeah. Guild discriminating against women, Ogilvy's work, et cetera, et cetera. But I think fighting to protect one's members in a group is slightly different from a clan because we know those guilds evolved then to become trade unions, the trade union movement. You know, that was pushing for the working class as a horizontal group. So isn't that slightly different? You know, that this is, you know, the guild is just the sort of early modern form of the trade union, right? It was much, much later, I think, that the, the development, at least for the craft guilds, they were often quite hierarchical. And there was a lot of actually passing down of um, positions from fathers to sons. Yeah, sure. So, on. so I think they have that, they have that way I think, as well. I think Henrik contests this. I think Henrik will contest that claim about passing down. But anyway, all right. Yeah, the data don't really support that, okay. actually. I don't oh, think really? so. Oh, really? No, I think it's quite it's quite clear um, that this happens increasingly over time. So, all right. okay, yeah. all right. So I have another question about the fall of Rome. So you suggest that the fall of Rome curtailed strong centralized state power, and that was that enabled the communal movement in Western Europe. But I wonder, is decentralization a sufficient condition? Because don't we also need to explain why the communal movement didn't occur in southern, decentralized southern Italy, in pre-Christian places like Germania, Scandinavia, or Africa, or decentralized areas of the Eastern Church like the Balkans? Yeah, I, I think part of it there would be that you didn't have the same growth of of, uh, of cities, but it's it's it, it occurs in a very wide swath of uh, of Europe, actually, the communal movement. So I don't think it's specific to and you're right and you're right that there are some areas the the northern versus southern Italy, 
um, distinction is a big one. I don't have a particular answer to that. A lot of people have tried that one over time. <laughs> that's not okay. that's not where I'm where I'm an expert. Yeah. Okay. I have another question about who is taxed. So your theory, and correct me if I misrepresent you, is that leaders want to extract the maximum, and that's partly a function of knowable productivity. But I wonder, when we look at Western Europe, taxation also seems to reflect the capacities of specific social groups to effectively resist extractive states. So if we look at who paid the highest taxes under the 16th and 17th century French and Spanish monarchies, or under Tsarist Russia, it was the poorest, right, who had to pay, you know, in front, bourgeois towns, the French aristocrats, and the guilds, right? The guilds, they all secured exemptions from Louis XIV's high taxes. Um, Louis XIV, was, and, and also, you know, Louis XIV was able to extract revenue because there was weak social cooperation, weak social capital between classes. So I wonder whether we also need a theory to account for organizational capacity to resist the desire to tax. You know, the, the idea that taxation isn't just a function of knowable productivity, but it also reflects how groups are organized in society, you know, whether that's through guilds or kinship, etc. No, I would I would agree with that completely. And so um, when we talk about uh, Western Europe during this period of collective governance and the medieval and early modern eras, uh, I, I'm, I'm not I would not at all want to sort of uh, uh, ignore the fact that certain people are paying higher taxes than others. And this this all depends. So if you think about Louis the 14th, even though he doesn't call the estates general, he organizes uh, and bargains with various provincial estates uh, many times. In fact, sometimes those provincial estates even lend him money, as in the case of Burgundy. And so when there's this process of bargaining or, 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 or cooperation between Louis and provincial estates, then one of the things that gets decided, OK, is we can pay you this much in taxes. And so then individual notables have to go back to their town and say, OK, what can we pay in terms of taxes? And there, who pays? Uh, ends up uh, differing to a great degree. You could think of, is there an income taxes or a wealth tax or are taxes based primarily on um, what we call uh, sales taxes? Um, and in Western Europe, uh, from the communal movement onward, it's very, it's very clearly the case that a lot of the taxation that occurred in the cities was of uh, indirect taxation that we think of as being having a regressive uh, incidence as opposed to uh, direct taxes on, on income or wealth. I'm with you. I'm with you. OK, my final question, David. Yes. What is the relationship between economic growth and democratization? Because for me, so for me, the main contribution of your book is your explain the initial heterogeneity in state capacity and political systems. And that has important long run uh, effects shaping regional variation in the world today. Europe and its offshoots have always been and remain more democratic. Um, so is it just a coincidence then that Europe uh, and its offshoots both have democracy and economic growth? Well, this is obviously the question that a lot of people have spent a lot of time thinking about. And I think it's a, it's a real problem, a difficult problem for social scientists because mm. uh, only one region of the world could be the first to industrialize, right? right. So you have sure. an N equals yeah. one problem. I think it is entirely plausible that eventually... Uh, the pattern of collective governance in Europe led to freer spread of ideas and technology um, for modern growth uh, based on scientific reasoning in a way that was less uh, likely to happen in, in the Middle East or, or China. Although, of course, we have to acknowledge, as I do emphasize in the one chapter of the book, that, that this is known that those other two regions were far ahead of Europe for a long time. Yes. Um, uh, so a lot of people, there's been a lot of ink spilled about whether democracy on average is better for growth or not. Answer seems to be probably, but how much we don't know. I think what I'd emphasize is instead of saying whether it's better on average or not, we need to think of the advantages and disadvantages of these two different systems for, for economic growth. And, the you know, the strength of the autocracies is that they can establish, they can make decisive action, but then the problem is decisive action can be good or can be bad. Sure, so in sure, China, sure. you see the Song Dynasty is quite active in promoting commercial development. The Ming Dynasty comes in afterwards and does just the opposite thing. Uh, whereas if you think of European rulers for a long time, they weren't really in a position to do much to promote uh, economic development. 
but nor were they in the position to harm it. Right. So, so your position is, do you think there maybe is a, a weak? So, and, and one thing you're, you're very clear on is you don't support modernization theory. You don't think that democratization is due to economic growth. No, I don't think that's plausible because if you go back and you think again of how uh, rich or poor European countries were at the time they democratized um, in the late 19th or early 20th centuries, um, they were quite poor by today's standards. And if you go back to Seymour Martin Lipset's really canonical work, this is really the initial work on modernization and democracy. Yes. He wasn't just saying, oh, because you have higher GDP you're likely to be democratic. No. He was using that a proxy for other things. He was saying- Like urbanization. Various aspects of modernity, urbanization, radios, telephones, motor vehicles. And these are things that of course are much more common in many countries today than they were say in, eight, in France in 1870 when we get the Third Republic uh, being established and being very durable. Uh, there was nothing of the sort. So would you, so, so would you support the correlates of uh, economic growth, like wage labor, urbanization, non-family um, employment, those are beneficial for democracy? A sort of Fukuyama style argument? Yeah, uh, perhaps. Chris, let me, let, yeah. let me push back. Let me push back. Let me play okay. um, devil's advocate for modernization theory, right? Mm -hmm. You know, let's look at um, non-communist East Asia, uh, Taiwan, South Korea. I mean, you know, you have the you know, uh, one of my favorite books is by Ku on the Korean workers, and you have this slow development of class consciousness and trade union, you know, through working together, through going on strike, etc., through organizing in factories, you have this development of class consciousness, very similar to what E.P. Thompson documented. And then it was the trade unions that were critical to democratization in Korea, right? And then, you know, you have this growth in demand for autonomy or self-government. And that seems to me to be the outcome of correlates of economic growth, you know, non-family employment, breaking up clans, breaking up kinship systems, moving to the city, mixing and mingling with all sorts of different people, hearing new ideas, um, assembling in the workplace. That seems in Taiwan and Korea to have, and, and if you look at panel data in Korea and Taiwan, we seem to see this, you know, shift um, towards more sort of voluntary associations. Uh, that seems to me to be an outcome of the process of modernization. Yeah, I would say that that is an outcome of the process of the way uh, economic production is structured. Yes, yes. If you have people in large plants producing things. Right, labor intensive economic growth. Large yeah, absolutely. plants yeah, yeah, are yeah, more, sure. more susceptible to being unionized than small plants are, for example. Yeah, yeah, no, for uh, sure. We can agree. Yes, absolutely. And so I think that I agree to that extent. But I think if we're going to get at that problem again, I think what you and I are agreeing on is that we need to talk about much more specific elements of modernity, so to speak. Although I wouldn't say that sort of having large plants is, is modernity because- No, no, yeah, yeah, for sure. Like in the, in the 1970s, right. 80s, yeah, right, yeah, yeah. Exactly. Um, but it, it's more, that's a better argument. It's a stronger argument than saying, oh, just because South Koreans got rich- No, no, uh, sure, I'm with be, you. They became democratic. Okay, I'm with you, I'm with you. All right, so David, let me, let me try to summarize your book. You're saying that Historically, many societies were democratic, and that's a major contribution, but not all societies were democratic. Some were democratic, others went down authoritarian. Which path they went down is a response to geography and technology, and then those sort of have persistent effects. Yeah, and then that explains regional variation. It's an awesome book, and I thank enjoyed you. talking to you. That's a better summary than I could give. <laughs> David, thank you very much, and for rocking our friars. Thank you. Bye. How was that? Perfect. Perfect. Okay. Was that okay with you, David? Yeah, I wasn't too resistant. No, it was great. And you didn't mind me. Now I'm going to press stop recording and I'm going to hope it saves somewhere.